everybody, welcome back to the Woods Ready Podcast. You're in the team room, and I have Rylan Neely. Hi. Hi. Hey, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's awesome to actually have you on here. Uh, yeah. I this is kind of ad hoc, obviously, since we're we're in the office here. But uh, dude, it's awesome to have you in town. Yeah, man, same. It's been great to get back to Nellis and see all the stuff that the Air Force has got going on. It's yeah, man. Cool. I I'm interested to see how, the reaction from this podcast because there's probably a lot of people out there that were <laughs> uh, on the receiving end of your mentorship and instructorship. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's a few out there. Uh, Hopefully, for the, for the ones who, who made it, uh, congrats. Welcome to Special Tactics and Special Warfare. Uh, for those who didn't, I hope you guys uh, give it another shot. It's really good on this, uh, this side of the fence, and uh, you will not uh, be regretful. Yeah. yeah. So, well, as, as we go into that, why don't you give a little background about, about yourself and where you found yourself yeah. you know, becoming a controller? So it's not going to be a really glorious story. Uh, it's basically grew up uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, close to Manitowoc. Uh, graduated from Valdez High School. Uh, at the end of high school, didn't really have quite a plan. Uh, so I went to University of Manitowoc, or I was going to uh, think about you know herd management, the dairy farm scene, uh, where I was going to go, um, and then from there I. I Got bored over a year. Okay, uh, was living in a four hundred twenty dollar all utilities included two bedroom apartment, uh, four forty East Street Avenue, uh, <laughs> apartment number six. <laughs> yeah, that was my motivation for never going back there. Um, and then then I just saw you know all my all my teammates. I was going to say classmates, uh, you know, doing something with their lives. Other ones went to the military. A couple of them tried out for SEAL. Uh, my my uncles were were in the Navy as well. Uh, and so I was asking uh, Uncle Kurt and Uncle Todd uh, on my mom's side, hey, we're, this is where I'm at. I'm pretty bored with my life. I feel like there's more out there. Uh, and I want to do something cool instead of just, you know, living uh, paycheck to paycheck uh, and trying to go to a, a, you know, a two-year associate's degree college because I didn't really have a plan. Right. Um, you know, just all, all my fault uh, for not being mature enough to realize, like, what, what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and then from there went to recruiter. I did go to the Marine, Navy, Army, thought about, uh, Ranger, Green Beret, uh, NSW, uh, Marsoc wasn't really, uh, wasn't really there yet. Um, but you know, do I want to be a Marine and then try out for force or whatever? Uh, but that it's its own weird pipeline. And then I started talking to the Air Force guy. Um, and then I just went in, I said, Hey, what's the hardest job you have? Like, what, what is something you guys have special operations? Cause it wasn't really well known, you know, mm -hmm. back in like 2005 to 2008, even so now, time frame. <laughs> even now. Um, so he said, yeah, there's combat control and there's pararescue. Um, one is like a high angle rescue specialist. It's like the people who go in to save pilots. Uh, and the other one in the height of the, uh, joint terminal attack control, uh, days where we're, you know, enabling green berets and NSW teams and, you know, the tier one has its own thing going on, but like, hey, they, there's this this unit called Combat Control, and he started talking about John Chapman in, in particular in the Battle of uh, Attacker Gar in Operation Anaconda. I remember sitting there, this was before Dan Schilling's book came out, uh, Alone at Dawn, and he started going through, um, hey, this, you know, March 4th, this is what Operation Anaconda looked like. You know, it was a constrictive uh, operation. You had your different, uh, your different MSSs or mission support sites, sorry. Uh, on top of uh, the ridge lines, and there, were, and then he went into this whole spiel about John Chapman, of how he saved the team. Uh, the seal fell off the the helicopter, um, and we didn't at that time have the the feed uh, from the pred that was released, you know, yeah. in 2017. Um, if you guys haven't seen that, look up Alone at Dawn uh, on YouTube. There's a eight minute video talking about what John Chapman is. Uh, it's an incredible, incredibly humbling video. It's really hard to watch, but um, that's just kind of like. When I saw that and I said, man, this is a career field that has like giants like John Chapman. Yeah. And I have a chance to try out for it with a direct contract uh, that allowed me to, you know, go to, um, what was it called at the time? Uh, we were not in Indoc. It was intro. Maybe, maybe it was selection, the two week one. Uh, the two week selection course before you go to air traffic man, control. I don't school. remember the name I of think, that one. I actually. think it was selection, right? 
because uh, we had separated from yeah. the PGA pipeline when I when I had come in. Now we're back together. But um, went there, got me in contact with uh, a guy called Staff Sergeant Flannery, uh, who is still in. Uh, he's actually coming out to the 321st, which is where I'm currently stationed. Uh, um, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, he ran me through my first pass test, and then I got to uh, got to San Antonio. Did basic training, which I didn't really enjoy. Um, then got to selection, and even still, throughout the pipeline, that two year process, I I was learning what combat control was as I was going through by talking to the instructors. Obviously, you have a bunch of literature that you're given, mm-hmm. of like Here, here's your core skills. You're gonna have you know, especially in air traffic control school and you get the, the two hours with the instructors in the morning. And yes, it was really hard, but it was, it was the, the indoctrination really of like what combat control is. Yeah. Uh, and then I haven't really looked back since. Um, it's, it's been, it's been an awesome, awesome career. I've been blessed to have the opportunities I've had. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you actually said one thing that I, I want to pull on a little bit is mm-hmm. you said at, at, I think at what age were you when you went in? 19. So 19. And you said, hey, I hadn't really matured enough to know what I was going to want to do. Right. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough that I knew what I was going yeah. to do. But, man, I, do you think that, that it's okay or a 19-year-old should 100% know what they want to do? No. Uh, okay. All no, right. Because no, no, no. I was sitting here going like, no, dang, no. dude, that's... Uh... No, I think... I was just speaking only for myself. Right. Uh, and then kind of seeing my growth. I was a little, little bit of a late bloomer as well. Uh, and so for me, I think probably because I'm pretty hard on myself and I hold myself to a high standard, which I think all of us, all of us, all do. of us do. Yeah. So like looking back in retrospect, going, man, like if I would have done this right or this right or this right and this right, where would I be in my career, in my life, whatever. Uh, and so that, that was one thing um, where I knew I, I, I procrastinated essentially. I knew that was a like an objective that was coming up in my life and I didn't really do the right things to get there and then I really needed like a kick in the butt of hey what are you doing? Why don't you go do something special? Cuz this is this is not it. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah, the rest is history really. Yeah, it's just, it's one of those things right? cuz our our demographic is, you know, folks that want to join or I mean there there's some that are watching that that you know don't have no intention to join but they they talk they use some of the things that we talk about yeah. in the private sector in their own lives or stuff like that but we got a lot of high school students and college students that are looking to join and some of them are kind of like i still don't know what i want to do and i you know with my own my own family right i'm like it's okay yeah. if you don't know at at a young you know 16 17 18 age if you you don't know what you want to do like right. i think that that's okay as long as you are kind of working towards something to better yourself. Yeah, hundred percent agree with you. Yeah. Um <laughs> I think I think on that in that same vein of talking about it's absolutely okay. I think having the the general goal of I want to do something special, you don't have to define that really. That that's kind of where I started. Of, yeah. I want to be a part of some community that is special. It's gonna push me. Uh and then hopefully I can contribute something to push them as well. Like the competitive atmosphere. I've always loved that. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, I just love being competitive. Yeah, I mean, so did you play any kind of sports in yes. school? Yes, um, so did basketball. Uh, pretty that much makes, that go, makes sense. You're pretty up, tall. <laughs> going up, but I fouled out way too much. Ah. Uh, so I decided to join wrestling. Uh, freshman year really is when I really got into it. Uh, was not very good. Um, got my butt kicked for the first two years. And there's this guy, Rod Figueroa. He was an Olympian back in the day. He was our high school coach. If you, if you end up listening, Rod, thank you again for <laughs> uh, kind of instilling hard work pays off. Uh, and he had these two sons who were both high school uh, champions for the state of Wisconsin, uh, Tyler and Logan. And uh, I was I was in between their ages, so I was always like, would have to wrestle Tyler for a bit. But luckily, he was a senior, and he was really big and strong in the heavyweight class, and he got my butt kicked by him. But me and Logan were only an age apart. So that was really my training buddy throughout it. Um, so was able to get in better shape, developed a better work ethic, but working in a farm atmosphere in Wisconsin, no. you kind of already have it. Um, so it just kind of added more tools uh, for me. You know, like running stairs for an hour and a half in like full sweat, sweatpants, sweat gear is not any fun. Uh, 
but that that same kind of like mental suck did can uh kind of come over and i didn't have you know what special warfare provides now back oh in it's incredible now uh exactly and like you have the whole human performance section uh that is like you know trying to measure your attributes your psychological testing where's your body at for resiliency uh and and you know kind of developing an individual plan with your own like group uh curriculum mm -hmm. uh that that we didn't have uh you know in terms of even like basic mobility knowledge and nutrition yeah. i mean I, I remember just pounding pizzas uh yeah. every, every friday <laughs> and saturday uh just because like it was like the thing to do thinking that i needed them to recover yeah. all the calories are burned no absolutely does not work like that uh, but going back, yeah, played basketball, wrestling, <laughs> college football, did golf for a year just to kind of relax in spring and then track and field. Okay. Uh, Man, you were all over the place. Yeah, I loved it. I loved yeah. sports. So. They, they, I think they're, they're fun and they're a big part of who we're recruiting from that pool. It right. doesn't mean that you have to have done it. Right. Um, it's just kind of setting a, a nice foundation and stuff like that. So I'll kind of jump forward a little bit because you've, you've, you've been in CCT for – 14 years. 14 years now. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, you, you've been around the block. Mm -hmm. uh, we first met when you were at the 321st yeah. over in England. Yeah. We first met in Estonia. Yeah, we did. <laughs> um, yeah. Which was an awesome trip. Yeah. Highly recommend yeah. Tallinn, Estonia. Yeah. Um, where, uh, you know, we were landing A-10s yeah. on, on a remote highway. Lots of pictures of that that were ended up in the magazines and, yeah. <laughs> and, and stuff like that, websites. But that was where we first met. And you've gone on to a couple different places. You've now returned to England. That's but right. what I want, really want to hit before we kind of go to that is your time at the Special Warfare training. Was it training squadron, training group? Yep. So I my <clears> first <throat> PCS from that tour in England that you saw at the end of 2019, 2020-ish. Um, they moved me to the 350th Special Warfare Training Squadron uh, back when it was called PREP. Okay. Um, and then there I was the, the section and flight chief. Uh, and then from there, once we changed the curriculum to go from the five or six classes a year, do we want to go to an eight-week curriculum? And then it turned into Special Warfare Candidate Course. Uh, then I was the superintendent. Um, <clears throat> while, I was at, uh, while I was still there within a year, um, I got moved to the Special Warfare Training Wing uh, A3, uh, the operations branch of it. Uh, from, and then from that little stint where I was there for, I think, five months, um, I got orders cut to go be the operations superintendent of 321. Okay. So you've got, like, from, from a, a you know, baseline squadron going all the way up through the wing, right. you've got a good idea of what the pipeline was and kind of what it is. Now, I know that you've been removed from that for two years almost. Oh, a year and a half. Year and a half. I was going to say, has it been that long? Yeah, a year and a half. <coughs> Jeez. Okay. So you may not be as versed as what it is yeah. now, but you're the new construct you are right. in terms of what it looks like, how we went from NDOC, left NDOC, and now we've joined back with, with PJs and now special reconnaissance. Right. So what was kind of your initial thoughts on – because I think you were there for the building of this, right? Right. Okay. Um, so working with uh, the staff that is there, uh, Dark, Doc Garcia, we had a bunch of contractors from T3I as well uh, helping us write the curriculum piece of it uh, and, and how, how we're going to jam, jam pack, you know, a uh, 10-week course down into eight weeks basically after basic training. Uh, so we started getting after, uh, you know, a basic military training program where you're actually going over there, but on a more kind of like contractual basis with mm. uh, the BMT squadrons of the expectation is special warfare cadre will come in uh, and and kind of like give them their pass tests, their initial uh, their initial fitness exams, and then um, kind of maintain like a calisthenic based approach with some like resistance weight training throughout it to basically give them the best shot they have um, and prepare for the Special Warfare Candidate course as a stepping stone, and then it moves with the ultimate end goal of, can I make it to the board to get uh, to have a chance to be selected or not? That's how we measured our success. Um, and that, that was, you know, basically turning the idea of what prep was uh, originally and just kind of fine-tuning it um, so that we could yield better results, but ultimately the operator uh, our eventual operator uh, will have a better chance of 
you know, less nagging injuries, but also being, uh, uh, have the best shot at making to the, through the selection because ANS is it's pretty hard. Um, <laughs> yeah. as I'm sure everyone is tracking, like assessment selection is, uh, it, it's a kick in the groin, uh, and it's going to hurt. Um, uh, but we need to measure, uh, your stress tolerance and how, and how you're going to able to fire, uh, or, sorry, how are you able to react under fire? Um, you know, while still meeting the mission intent, looking after your teammates, uh, and still getting after what uh, aspect war is really about mm -hmm. in the joint environment. Um, so I think that all starts with, uh, you know, assessment selection. Yeah, it's definitely a different training mindset because we went from, hey, we're going to take you off the street mm. and, you know, for use the, the metaphor of the pool, you're going to jump in the pool and you either sink or swim. You, you either survive <laughs> or you don't. Right. Um, with with no development, no training, no. It's just you better survive, and right. we're pit the we're picking the survivors. Right. Now it has gone to a, okay, we're going to recruit you appropriately, develop you, um, help starting from a from a, you know, nothing. Start building a a stress tolerance level throughout development, throughout basic training, because now we've got our own. Um, we don't have our own basic training, but we definitely have our own basic training flights right. that are special warfare flights. So they get, you know, more PT, more sleep, I think more food as well. Right. And then, <clears throat> and then, but, but they're constantly getting that mentorship and that kind of stuff. And now we're going to send them to prep or what is now SWIC right. and then go through ANS. So it's a, it's a nice slow buildup. Um, so it's, I'd like to think we're training and developing smarter than what we were. That's not that's not the downplay what what Indoc was because I think Indoc was extremely valuable, right? Um, or or whatever that in between was as well because the product that we got the, we got some amazing human beings out of that. Right. But I definitely think that there were some people that maybe didn't know how to swim or they had never they were they didn't grow up around a pool. Or they didn't really know what they were getting into. And then it was like, all right, survive. Huh. And it's like, oh, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. I have no idea what massive snorkel recovery is. And then end up failing out or or quitting. Mm -hmm. And now we've we, you know, could have lost the, you know, the next, you know, John Chapman, the next Barry Crawford, the next yeah. Rob Gutierrez, the next whoever you want to say, you know? Right. Um, so I definitely think we're training smarter I think now. So. I, I agree with that. And going back into the, from my time there, of what I, I, the pool is never going away, right? Like as far as the struggle factor. Um, and I feel like that is a, a, that's probably the best thing that BMT and SWIC provide is that, that start initial block of underwater confidence and well, really water confidence as well. Because when you're swimming in a pool with 60, 60 teammates, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's worse than the North Sea, right? Yeah. Like, uh, you get kicked in the face, you're going to get a flooded mass whether you wanted to or not. Um, and people will freak out. And I, we would see a lot of times where you have the congested waterways um, where, you know, guys with SIE uh, mm -hmm. right away um, basically say, this isn't for me. Uh, I quit. Or when you start to introduce mask and snorkel recovery, your underwater's on a certain interval. Uh, drown proofing, which we've seen across the different components uh, for all the ones that are involved in combat dive. Uh, that's always been a struggle uh, for a lot of people. And the only thing that, I, that I've seen that I can recommend is um, you have to really know like, what, the, uh, what the end goal is of what is my objective in this phase of stress. And I've seen guys who, when it clicks for them, they're not even focused anymore about I'm getting hypoxic, I'm starting to get the uh, gurgle in their throat um, and they kind of control their mind by focusing on something else mm -hmm. uh, in the moment which translates directly into combat uh, as well where you know if you're taking effective fire but yet you know you still need to have an exfil of a nine line for a HH60 coming in with you know some kind of danger close gun run uh, that that's stressful while still trying to relay to the teammates to get their updated grids to make sure you're not having any kind yeah. of fracture side um, not saying that's a direct translation, but that's one of the most effective ones that we've seen uh, that kind of pull out those same emotions uh, and stress that we want to see. 
Um, and pe when people are able to switch on to that kind of end state of what, what I'm trying to focus on, uh, the, the results just kind of come through. And, it, and once it clicks, you, you got it, you build your confidence. And then after you're like, you're broken down, like the whole process of the pipeline is also to build, build you up so that you're a confident operator when you show up to the teams uh, and, and you know your stuff, you're physically fit, you're mentally fit, uh, and you're going to be a reliable new aspect war uh, teammate who's going to be able to go out and do great things for America, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah, I in in that you bring up a really good point, and I, I want to dive in on a little bit is the the paying attention to something else whenever you're you know you missed a breath or, or you right. weren't allowed a breath while buddy breathing uh, using like using that as an example focusing on something else sometimes that in my mind is focusing on your buddy like especially using that uh that buddy breathing right. so you and i are buddy breathing i missed it like it's my goal to just i like if i can feed you that snorkel yeah. more and more and then in turn you're trying to feed me the snorkel okay i missed a breath boom you got it cool now i can get a breath like whatever man it's almost to the point where like one of you have got to take the snorkel and take a breath exactly. kind of thing and now i'm focusing on that and i think that that kind of service of you or, or caring about you or your requirements and your needs more yeah. than my own translates to a lot of parts of our job and it can tra translate to you know the just being the best you can at the job it can translate to even you know people like talking about the the suicide issues that we're having now is yeah. is instead of focusing on me 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 i've got to take care of myself right. why don't i take care of you Right. Or take care of other people, and you know the the requirements you need, or the needs that that person has, or the issue that that person has. It doesn't mean that I'm taking it on, but maybe I've dealt with that before, and maybe I can help them out, help pull them out, and at the same time get me out of whatever rut I'm in. So I I, I think there's so many different you know applications that that mindset that you're talking about applies to. Yeah, a hundred percent. Even like with when you look at well, why did Pararescue uh, trainees, for example, uh, whenever they come in, that's kind of the, what they say they want anyways. So this is just the same process of if you can recage it in your mind of I'm going to have to go through really bad things so that this other person can live. Uh, I mean, that's their whole model that others may live, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's kind of where it starts is that uh, unselfish behavior of putting more stress or sacrificing something for yourself so that peaches can have a breath when, when I may not. And I am expecting or knowing since it's bred in that kind of, kind of teammate camaraderie that you are going to do the same. That's across all SOCOM. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Well. That's that, you know, this guy's going to have my six, uh, but I know I've got, you know, low and high as far as wh wherever my sector of fire is. And that's, you know, not just literal, that's for all things, whether you're going through a really bad time with your marriage Kids are struggling in school. You're going through your own up and downs, giving PTSD or, or some kind of injury recovery. It all really starts with like, well, how can we make better human beings uh, so that they can be better teammates at the end of the day? And I think that's what we do really well in aspect work. Yeah, and it's not a judgmental thing. Like, okay, you're you're struggling and you're missing. You know, when you start talking about high and low in terms of coverage, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like, okay, well, you're you're so focused on on being down and in, and you're completely missing this. Well, okay. I'm not going to be judgmental about you missing this right. unless there's a, a more serious problem going on. Like, okay, dude, like you were covering that before. Now you're not. Okay. Now I know something's wrong right. instead of you're just, well, you're just slacking now. There's a difference, right? Yeah, 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 just exactly. to be clear. Um, exactly. But it's, it's recognizing that and going, okay, you're focused on that. I'm plugging a hole or it, and it's, it's just like equating it to, you know, being inside the house doing CQB. Is like okay, yeah, well, I got it. The, the the number one man went the wrong way, or the number two man went the wrong way. Okay, well, what am I gonna just sit in the door and go, hey, no, dude, you're supposed to go this way. No, he went that way. Okay, cool, I'm going this way then. It's it's you just got to cover each other, and it's it's important that we are we are covering each other's back as much as we possibly can because I my weaknesses might be your strengths and vice versa. Right. And as long as we're able to work as a team, um, you know, even if we don't agree with each other, yeah. we could we could hate each other's guts. Right. But as long as I know, like, okay, well, you're good at this, and I'm bad at this, and, and we can mesh and go out there and do the mission, like, 
we're, we're going to succeed. Right. That was uh, that's actually you brought up a line that we used to quote to the uh, the students all the time was remember the Titans, uh, where they're in the chow hall saying I don't care if you guys hate each other but you will respect each other, because uh, at the end of the day like it doesn't really matter how I feel about you personally we're we're both there for the same thing we're on the same team, um, and and even in those instances they're honestly they're like you know they're they're so rare that you really yeah. despise somebody uh, especially in the career field because you usually mostly like-minded with a mm-hmm. lot lot of commonalities uh regardless of race age sex whatever um like you find a lot of common ground because i mean you both signed up for the same career field the same job there's you know goal number one of what we have in common as friends <laughs> uh and you're going and you're both having the same struggles um so i think that's another piece of in uh in any kind of indoctrination that's important uh just like you see in battle like bonds are forged through hardship Mm-hmm. Um, and and not just the hardship, but the overcoming uh, of, of those hardships. Because then you get you build the confidence. You have trust in each other, trust in your equipment, trust trust in your team. Uh, and I think I think that's one thing that that we we instill really well, and, and we reinforce it with success throughout the career field. Even though it might not feel like, man, we really had a good day today at the pool. <laughs> we really had a good day on that ruck. We had a really good day on that that assault that assault course. Uh, that was sarcasm. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say there was never a good sarcasm. Day. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you learn to to find like joy and happiness in those bad times, which then like, man, you just come up with like you'll have one guy who's really dark humor, uh, and then you'll have another guy who's just like kind of like the comedic relief. Uh, and those are some of the dynamics that that you're able to copy and paste of like where you fit in uh, as far as your personality as an individual, and you, and you translate it directly when you when you're working with another soft team across the yeah. and it's not just the u.s you know like from gbr to uh nato allies to indo-patcom guys indo-pacific sorry um, no, it's, you gbr and i'm like yeah, okay well obviously Britain, you're talking about great Britain. yeah yeah sorry <laughs> acronyms gotta keep yeah. me honest on those yeah yeah, yeah. oh dude I'm t- the acronyms yeah. are the worst because we'll sit here roll them up and try you know the whole point is to try and educate right yes. so we'll try and go okay uh, what is that? Oh, what you know, the acronym that you're like, uh, gee, uh, man, dude, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but I, exactly. I know what it is. I don't know what it spells. Exactly. <laughs> so um, in terms of what you saw there, what were like, you, you saw a, I mean, dude, you were there for a while. So you, you saw a, I mean, well over a thousand students. Yes. Probably, probably two or 3000 students yeah, come through. Um, what were the first question would be is what were some of the like negative trends that you saw mm. for for them and on the on the flip side they, you know I'll ask you what the, some of the positive things you saw but like as from a negative aspect you know obviously you have people that didn't prepare you know didn't work out or or failed their first pass test because at the time you were there I think it was pass test and it transitioned to the IFT. IFT. Thank you. So, yeah. um, so what you know, you have those people. You have people that, when they left the recruiter, they were able to pass. They go through basic training. They come out on the other side, and they can't pass an IFT. So those are things that obviously uh, are some negative trends. But what are some other probably bad characteristics or some negative trends that you may have seen there? Well, how much t- time we got, dude? I'm totally putting you on the spot here. So, yeah. uh, I mean. And this is just in my personal opinion. Right, yeah, yeah. Not, this is not, not this is not the, the opinions of the DOD or the yeah, Air Force yeah, exactly. or anything like that. In my personal opinion, uh, and also one of my pet pet peeves uh, as a leader on team, now in the operations superintendent spot, someone who uh, finds excuses for whenever they didn't meet the end state, um, they never take accountability or responsibility for their own mistakes, which also puts a block on them actually progressing as well. Until you can learn to accept. I failed at this. I'm not prepared for it. It also shows that you're you're not the right person or mature enough to take the right actions necessary to correct that mistake or learn from them. Uh, it also it also tells a lot about a person who is able to be humble, uh, no sense of entitlement, and they're they're hungry and they're there to work, um, and they're also there to learn. Right, learn from other people who have years of ex- decades of experience more than them. Um, not just that, you know, they're there, there is never like I have made it moment. Those mm-hmm. are the, those are the, 
uh, the candidates that I saw that, that eventually did fail for the most part, um, they would have all those negative attributes that I talked about. But um, the ones who did make it and then would end up getting the team and not being successful uh, were the ones who, all right, I made it through assessment selection, got my beret, made the team. I'm not an apprentice anymore. Now I'm a, you know, a journeyman, a five-level on team. I got my first rotation out, and, I, and I've made it. Uh, there, there's never a moment where you've made it because uh, once you become stagnant, uh, you've lost. You've, lo- you've lost the battle. You've lost yourself. You lost why you originally started anyways. Uh, so maintaining like excellence as you kind of go through because uh, you're not just making yourself better. You're making your teammates mm-hmm. to your left and your right better as well because they see you performing. They see you getting better. Uh, and if we lose that competitive atmosphere, like even not to get like real big about the strategic impacts, but it really starts in the tactical level, the team room level. If we don't continue to push ourselves and you think you've made it at a moment, we have lost. Uh, and there's someone out there on the other side of the aisle who is training to kill you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think they have the same sense of entitlement. I don't think they have the same sense of I've made it, uh, which is something that we see in culture uh, with instant gratification. Uh, that that sometimes translates into the uh, to this process when it when it it almost you know it's a, the yin and yang it's the polar opposite of what we're really looking for. Yeah. So <clears throat> sorry, I know I kind no, of that was, tangent there. That but. was that was perfect. That gave me all kinds of uh, in, info, <laughs> and I'm gonna cut the hell out of this because <laughs> yeah. you you nailed everything that we we talked about and 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 more, and the fact that you were there and you saw it in person, right. whereas you know. Aaron, he saw it because he was at uh, the PJ schoolhouse. Right. He he wasn't an indoc instructor, anything like that. So he saw that. Mm-hmm. You know, you had Trent. He was at. Um, I think he did all all of those echelons as well mm-hmm. um, there. Uh, and then me, I I never spent any time at Lackland. Right. Um, I either spent all my time at you know eight years at three twenty first. Yeah. Or, um, you know, spent a lot of time here at Nellis and, yeah. and a couple other, you know, along the way, but I never was a, a line instructor. Um, so I, I think it's important what you said in terms of kind of trying to gain the experience of, of, those, de- of those instructors who have decades of experience and understanding that they are, they are the end goal of what you're trying to shoot for, but at the same time, they, as instructors, they should also know that they have not made it. So, uh-huh. and, and as you're, you know, looking up to those instructors, just know that when they leave and they're done being an instructor yeah. and they go to the 321st, yeah. you're gonna like, see them again. so you well, you're going to see them again, but also when you showed up for the second time where you're at, you know, you're, you're out there as the op soup, maybe some of those dudes don't know who you are. They don't know your name. They don't know what you're about. And I bet you had a feeling, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, that that you're still having to prove yourself. You okay. are still go. I can't just assume that because you're wearing senior or I'm wearing chief here that I we walk in the door and it's automatically like squared away knows what he's doing. Right. No, every assignment you go to, every team you're attached to, you've got to establish your own credibility you cannot you know rest on your laurels or just like oh well my name's out there people know me people know that i'm just i'm shit hot so right. we're good to go um and and you as an e8 level mm-hmm. still felt that right uh so when i got vectored over the 321st right um master sergeant i was get, i got put in to an e8 position right that's what the op soup is so I already was showing up knowing there were other E sevens there of man, I really have got to to work hard for the unit, work hard for operations, work hard for my commander, um so that I can buy some credibility so I'm not some guy just showing up um who doesn't have the swasta really to <laughs> to run operations in conjunction with the operations officer. Um and so that that's always kind of been on the four forefront of my mind as I, as I've sat there in the, in that position as a master of mm-hmm. how can I be better? How, what can I be doing, uh, to, to get more money, more, uh, more mission for, for the men and women, uh, more, 
more opportunities for our younger guys uh, since, you know, uh, OEA, or sorry, Operation Enduring Freedom went down, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Syria, um, our crisis response missions went down in Stuttgart. So what can I do to, to provide more opportunities for them uh, and get after strategic level threats? So it's not just, we're just chasing free chicken out in Europe just to check a box and make, make me feel validated. So right. that was really hard, uh, really hard to originally start up because there was a, a little bit of that. Just like you said, that is, that is normal. And luckily I've been around uh, for a minute. So I understood that coming into it. Um, but I think uh, work ethic, um, being credible, proving yourself and still maintaining uh, being hungry, as you see, like in the senior NCO rank, you lead by example, especially mm -hmm. in a special tactics squadron. And I have made tons of mistakes throughout throughout my career. Tons of mistakes in the past year, right? Uh, how, about, how about the last couple of days? The last couple, like, yeah, last couple of days here, like making making some silly briefs. Um, <laughs> but I, I think at the end of the day, to your point of people will see that, um, and that's really what the culture culture is all about and it's not just what about the people want like have the intrinsic motivation yourself to be like yes. i need to be better um that's another one of my pet peeves you don't need external people to tell you like oh good job uh, bad boy and bad in your back you're doing great as the opposite <laughs> uh no like if you are your your hardest critic uh and, and that's fair and as objective as you can be um while tying in all the the wants and needs of everyone who work above you to the side of you and below you uh, you, you will be successful in some measure. You, you like, and if not, you're you're that you will be that type of person, anyways, to ask for help from your teammates who will help you be uh, get where you need to be. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we we kind of went down a rabbit hole on the yeah. We did, the, sorry. But the, 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 no, that's fine. I took I took us that way because <laughs> yeah. I wanted to go that way. Yeah, yeah. Um. But what I what I don't want to leave behind is. So we talked about the kind of negative attributes and the negative things that you saw there. But on the on the flip side of that, what are some of the positive things where you're like, okay, this person came in and they they had this characteristic, this, this, um, you know, and you obviously have the 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 uh, the obvious ones in terms of okay, the person was honest, the person was physically prepared, the person is just, you know, a good teammate. They're a good follower when they need to be a follower. Right. They're a good leader when they need to be a leader. Yeah. So what are, other apart from those, unless you want to dive in on some of those, what are some of the other positive things that you saw from, I got, from candidates? I've got a few. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, so just so you know, we're at 38 minutes right now. So. Oh, wow. Half it goes fast. It, it does, yeah. I, I just don't want to keep you in case you got some place to yeah, be. Yeah, okay. Um, the, the most positive ones that I've seen are even the same same ones I'm sure you've seen as a troop chief are are the guys who show up regardless of rank and they're trying to constantly improve their foxhole uh, essentially and what I mean by that is say we're all laying on the pad we're waiting for instruction uh, the class is ended for the day uh, early and you know the students have free time so what are they doing with their free time are they trying they're just going to go be selfish and just take care of themselves Meaning, like, go up to their and just bunk out at five o'clock in the afternoon, wait for the chow hall to open, and then hopefully no one calls them on their crap for not helping out with the team team dues and uh, you know doing chores around the house. Like, you know, you've seen as a father, as a husband, like you, you have dues to pay. Yeah. Uh, and there's some people out there who purposely, when they're not having a finger over them, uh, is, is basically like lack of integrity mm. uh, of what it comes down to. Um, and and when we say that, I'm not saying like hey, man, you're like stealing or whatever. But uh, the characteristics of what we're looking at, like you're ultimately putting yourself uh, in your comforts and your needs uh, ahead of the teams, uh, the mission, whatever it may be. And what's even worse is that you just kind of skim off, hopefully no one calling you on your stuff uh, to, to get away from the limelight of seeing that. And the, the, best, the best ones that I saw were the exact opposite of that, uh, where they would purposely... Um, even like, you know, they're, they're team leaders, right? So you have like prior service folks who come in from, you know, say, an E6 or an E5, and they're leading this group of 100 new airmen uh, as they're showing up. And they're the first ones to, uh, you know, pick up a rake and start um, doing the leaves, taking out the trash, weeding when it, you know, like, and trying to stay ahead so you don't have an instructor being down like, hey, we have attention to standard details, the typical, like, catch-22 gotcha. Yeah. Uh, 
and they're taking care of those things to try to should try to buy more free time yeah. for their team. And it's an amazing thing when you have a hundred individuals who are doing all that for each other. And it's like, if you're one of the instructors going, I got nothing for them. Do you yeah. want to have them go write a paper? Wait, what are we doing? Are we wasting our t- their time? You know what I mean? And, and that translates directly over into an operational environment when you're on a mission of what could I do to prepare better and to make, you know, this assault troop better, this security team better, you know, and, and, uh, and it really all starts with like little things as you're going through it and you're like, why in the heck am I going to get down, join in the Air Force and I'm here just cleaning, cleaning the floors or mopping or doing any of that stuff. One, combat control, CCT really stands for combat cleaning team in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> Uh, the second part, uh, is it, it, it demonstrates those unselfishness, uh, unselfish characteristics that, that we're looking for. Um, and, and those were the best individual that I saw that were able to translate it. And it was almost a contagious thing for their team. And it actually kind of established the culture. The second ones that I saw, uh, were, as I'm sure you've heard, bottom up imperative type of leaders where you have like an airman. Uh, who is leading his team by example, whether it's physical output, never quitting, just having sheer grit. Because um, we're not asking him to do complex tasks at that point in the pipeline, um, to, sp- specifically, you know, at SWIC, mm-hmm. right? We're asking them to perform, get used to the indoctrination and the culture of what they're preparing for for ANS, uh, and, and ultimately, you know, kind of uh, integrate into military lifestyle and aspect war lifestyle. So, the best ones were the ones who were able to, in those uh, simple tasks, but difficult tasks of, i.e., an example would be like, we're going to have the magic mile run. Uh, you need to all be under six minute miles, blah, 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 blah. If you don't, well, then we're going to pay the man because we all struggle as a team. We're going to do, you know, eight counts until we do it right. Um, and those guys were the ones who would always push their teammates across the finish line. And even more so when their, their so-called leader, self usually appointed by the staff based on rank at that mm-hmm. point, not competency or performance, uh, the team is able to rely on them. And it's an interesting dynamic for people to watch who haven't really been in a team dynamic really as they come in, which is another, another thing we could talk about as far as like backgrounds of people coming in. And I don't mean anything like geopolitically either. I mean, just like backgrounds of stuff and behaviors that you've experienced at correlate directly to yeah. what you're trying to do sports, uh, sports. It, it, whether it's an individual sport or a team yeah. sport sometimes you, or you didn't play at all so you know there's just different dynamics of right. different coaching you know right. if, if it's tennis or wrestling it, it's kind of individual whereas if it's yeah you know, or or even track you know but if it's football soccer basketball lacrosse you right. know it's very team oriented right um but yeah, hopefully that answers your, your question about um, the good attributes that we've seen is, is basically the unselfish ones who are uh, trying to look out for their team, putting everyone else's needs before their own, uh, the ones who have the bottom-up imperative, and, the, and then there's also ones that you just have that like almost chip on your shoulder in a polite way. Right? Yeah. This is the third one, the ones that I really, I really enjoyed because I, I probably saw a lot of myself in that chip on your shoulder trying to prove to the world that yourself you're not some kind of like jerk uh, yeah. that is just lashing out uh, based on like family issues or whatever. <laughs> uh, but you have a chip on your shoulder with something to prove to the world. And yeah. so like that, an individual like that uh, is like a dog with a bone. You're not going to take that away from them. Uh, and, and I really appreciated that because it, it, the grittiness of the never quit attitude really comes out in that third, that third person. Um, and the trifecta is when you get all of those, those three attributes together. Uh, this is just my opinion. I know like yeah, yeah, yeah. Rand's got its own study for what they find as a value human being, but just what I've seen in my own experiences, special warfare, like if you had one or all three of them, um, and you usually were successful. Yeah. If you come with the assumptions that you, you laid out of being, have integrity, excellence. Yeah, yeah. Those smart, are the foundation. The baseline. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The ba- if you have the baseline, you have all those other ones, like you'll be fine. Yeah. It, it's funny because they, you know, as you look at the military and, is stereotypical military. You you know you have people that are in charge, and you got the you know the the command relationship, right? And oh well, this person you know boiling it down to a, a SWIC team. Okay, well this NCO or this officer is in charge, and no one else is a leader. But with that bottom up <coughs> kind of thing, like you can you can lead and be a, a, a set the culture for a team, and not be that NCO or not be that officer. 
you could do it as a brand new person exactly. by showing everything she's talked about in terms of being one of the best physically. Always helping out, being the first, without having to be told, being the first person to pick up that broom. Being the first person that, oh, you see a, a mountain of trash? Well, I'm going to take that out. And not only am I going to take that out, hey, anybody else got any trash and needs to go out? Let yeah. me grab that. And say, hey, it's great that you're grabbing the trash when no one else did. Right. But now you're taking a step further when you're going around and going, hey, let me go ahead and help you out and right. serve you guys, the rest of the team, as much as I possibly can. People see that. People notice that. And they may not be tangible right off the bat mm -hmm. because they're just so young and they're so, oh, I got to survive the pool. I got to survive this right. rug. But they remember it and it sticks with them right. and it will follow them. You're exactly right. The servant, servant leadership, uh, which is important even in our, I appreciate uh, like a, an 06 uh, up the ranks where you look and, and the, one of the things that some of the great leaders that I've seen in my career have always even at their level, uh, basically saying, hey, I'm here to serve you, uh, even though we work for him or her, right? Yep. Um, uh, but some of the best leaders I've seen have a servant leadership-like mentality of what can I do from you and my position of authority or competence or whatever rank, uh, and how can I make your life or your job, your day, your mission, your equipment better, yep. uh, your tactics, whatever it may be. And those are some of the best, best teammates, best leaders, best subordinates uh I, i've ever i've ever had the pleasure of working yeah no absolutely yeah um i would agree with that so we're at 137 right now you got a bounce or can you talk for 10 more minutes yeah i got i got i got another 20 okay i got another 20 but it's with drive time yeah so anything else about the pipeline that you want to get off your chest or or think that would, would be important before we kind of move on to the operational side of the house i would say um not to give too many of the, the keys to the castle. I don't want to hear any of my homies from Special Warfare hitting me up. <laughs> oh, you're going to hit them up anyway. Uh, <laughs> or they're going to hit you up, rather. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I, I think people stress way too much about the extended training day stuff. Mm. Um, I, I think just realize it's gonna, there's going to be a couple of days, just like all the time uh, in your career when you're deployed, of, man, you may have to pull a 32-hour day, you know, a 28-hour day, even like. I wouldn't even scoff at a 20 hour day. Those get really long, really hard, yeah. especially when you have a kid on. <laughs> um, and I think that was one of the main questions I saw uh, when I, well, at least when I was a flight chief, I was still around the students, not when I was the superintendent as much. Uh, when I was the, the flight chief for, uh, or course chief, I call it, the course chief for them, um, you get students come in during your peer mentoring time of like, well, how should I prepare for the extended training day? Like, what can I do to stay awake or uh, how bad is it going to be? And it's just, I mean, if you're already thinking about that, uh, <laughs> you're not in a good spot. Uh, so just kind of let it go and just realize like, Hey, no matter what, no matter what happens or what's thrown in front of me, I can always do more and I can always go one more mile. I can always go one more hour. I can, if you have that mentality of breakfast to lunch to dinner, uh, of just making it event by event, uh, evolution by evolution, you're going to be just fine. Yeah. Uh, and you're wasting brain cells, and you're spiking, you're spiking your stress levels for for no reason. Like just just take it day by day, and then if you can figure out, uh, like in our pipeline, we probably ran a lot more because we valued a little bit of different things. But there was that that Zen moment of when you we called it zombie mode when you're going zombie. Uh, That's a real where, thing. Yeah, where you could just like, oh, I can run a seven minute mile, you know, in in your prime, right? <laughs> seven minute mile. You know, for five miles and all will just be fine. And we're carrying a rock and we're doing Jody's and, and you kind of just kind of just zombie out. Um, those were some of the best when you when you actually find that 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 spot of how to perform that. And I can't tell you how uh, it just yeah. kind of happens. And then when you when it, you see it of like you realize that you're you're unsmokable, we'd call it. Uh, so I think if students can find that uh, they're going to be successful uh, and not to stress about stuff that's out of your control. You're there to be, a, you're there to get kicked in the groin to show that you are tough enough to be there at yeah. the end of the day. So as much as we want to like give them advice, like my advice as an operations superintendent at an operational squadron is we need warriors. We need operators who are going to do the mission and never quit. Uh, and you, there's no ways around it. Uh, you have to show that you can, uh, succeed and accomplish mission in hard tasks that other normal people cannot do. Hence why it's called special, special operations, 
aspect spec war <laughs> socom whatever you want to call it and i think that that's a piece that um we we often miss i feel like because we're almost afraid to 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 tell that to new students because we don't want to we don't want to shock them or push them yeah. away or scare them either and i'm not saying like oh it's a shock factor like we've seen on teams sometimes where you're, you're supposed to be intimidated um it is it's more of a realism way of looking at it of like you when you get selected you also want to feel like i i earned this my, my team earned this i i am different yeah uh and i want to be different i want to continue i want to break past the mold of everyone else around my age group you know so yeah that's just my opinion on that no i mean and it's every single bit of that i agree with and i, and I think it's a valid point right so now i don't have to ask you what your advice would be to new people coming in at the end of this so that, that that was great. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's almost like you've done media stuff. Before. Almost, yeah. <laughs> yeah, three thirty. I think. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate the advice. Yeah, yeah. If you guys aren't tracking, uh, that's you, not. You, no, no. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. All right, cool. Go ahead. Uh, well, I don't even know what it was out, but you were the kind of poster boy for. for the, <laughs> For the three thirtieth, I think, wasn't it? Uh, I was not a poster boy. I was I was picked uh, to go do a lot of the media engagements. One was Spartan Games. That was another one of them that they set up for that us. That looked awesome, by the way. The other, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, the other one was like the special warfare videos that are out. I'm sure you've seen mm -hmm. the special warfare overview. Um, that was when I was in the superintendent role. Uh, okay, and they picked me so that I could speak smartly because. At that point, we were starting up. Um, that's a little bit of humility here. Uh, that I was well versed in how to talk to um, DVs as they came through because special warfare at that point was starting up. New funding, new equipment. How are we going to do the curriculum? That comes with a lot of scrutiny. Um, so I mean, yeah, I had to. I had my talking points laid out uh, for sure, pretty pretty well. Uh, Written by people who are a lot smarter than me, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, because there are certain <laughs> words that they want you to use and don't use. Right. Uh, it also helps when you're not a bad looking dude. You're not. Oh, thanks. You're not fat. <laughs> yeah. And you're you're kind of tall yeah, too. That's so true. like you know, <laughs> thanks, it kind of all checks. Guess yeah. who they're not picking? <laughs> that's they, the they are not picking me. So, <laughs> or that, or it's the camera angle from down here to make it seem like yeah, a taller yeah. and the lighting. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that, lot, like circle light lighting. that you see on like Instagram videos yeah. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so you were now at the 321st over mm -hmm. in Milton Hall, um, loving the UK for the second time. Yeah. And I promised you that I would not ambush you, and I'm not doing that. But you have recently got done doing some pretty cool stuff, which is highly, highly classified and all that kind of stuff. We can't really go into a lot of those details. Right. Um, and I, I, I would never set you up that way. But, you know, you, you hear a lot of the, the folks talking about like, okay, we're not in Iraq, we're not in Afghanistan, we're, we're you know, things have kind of quieted down. Right. We're in peacetime. Guess what? We're not in peacetime. This is right. not, this is not a thing. So right. um, there are operations going ongoing right now that you guys, and especially you, but you and your unit are directly involved in. Right. So not that I'm trying to get after, hey, what are you guys doing? But I'm just trying to, to recharge and reemphasize that people are still out doing things. Right. So if you can dive in on that a little bit, if you can, yeah. without, again, trying to... Yeah, make sure you hit tap, pause. <laughs> yeah, uh, tiptoe through the sensitivities yeah. of it. So, <laughs> yeah, just to your point of... Uh, Special Tactics is incredibly busy, especially the overseas units. Um, if you need any more about what what is going on, at least for the audience, turn on the news. Um, but our involvement in Europe, for example, um, if you look at like what Congress pushes out as far as like a national defense strategy, uh, everything we're really focused on. So we were focused back for the last twenty years on enabling a team counter VEO, counterterrorism fight, uh, the war on terror, uh, essentially, uh, for, you know, stemming from the awful attacks on September 11th. Um, so now we have shifted focus into the most recent bud word over the last 10 years, not like is the near peer fight, uh, which involves a lot more than just shooter, JTAC, team, 
bomb drops and we get off the X, grab the bad guy, grab the explosive or the high ma- homemade explosives or, you know, blow it in place and then we're out. Um, the stuff we are doing now uh, is, is correlating to uh, the wider Air Force, really, in the Department of Defense. Uh, we, we are we are involved in uh, a lot of things that involve uh, you know decision makers and policymakers that we really would have no business talking to because of what we are doing is so important uh, to the national security and like U- United States interests uh, essentially. And a lot of that work is is in Europe and also in Indo uh, Indo Indo Pacific regions. Um, but. There's an active conflict going on in Europe, uh, if you cur- in the Ukraine conflict, um, as we've seen from you know our uh, from DC pushing their the, their aid packages that are going through. Um, Europe is not a safer place right now than than it was you know 15 years ago, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, even even I would even argue from like the annexation of Crimea in 2014. Um, and those things, because NATO is over there, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, they, we have a bunch of allies, uh, and it is our job, based on what we started after World War II, with our alliance with them, uh, is to prepare our allies and our friends um, to defend themselves any, in any kind of conflict. Should it spill over, say, a rogue missile happens from the Ukraine conflict and happens to hit in Poland, like mm. we thought it did. Uh, two years ago, or maybe which was on open source, uh, you know, a, a British RC-135 takes a shot from a, a Russian Su-35, and then it downs it, and then we get drug into a war. So uh, a lot of the, the things that combat control, pararescue, SR are involved in uh, are setting conditions, basically, um, to allow the U.S. to be successful while having immediate effects. Uh, what they're doing now, I guess, essentially. I think um, emerging technologies, uh, we've always been on the forefront of uh, comms matrices, new waveforms, what are we going to do for some kind of like handheld laser system, uh, you know, comms pathways, getting it down into a, a Samsung phone, whatever. Yeah. And those are always going on. And I think special tactics uh, in aspect war in general of what they're doing is they're developing new things that is allowing us to employ technology that uh we 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 never would have gotten there without <laughs> without aspect war right um and getting after say like you know uh the uh the counter uas problem uh un- unmanned aerial system sorry uh yeah. the counter <laughs> uas thing or swas the the small one right um special tactics in general now is like getting back into uh the uav game and there's a lot of capability out there that, that UAVs are able to provide. Um, and we're able to use some of the tactics that the Ukrainians are learning and translating it over to our near peer stuff that we're, we're really worried about for, for another mode of employment, whether it's a kinetic effect, whether it's a non-kinetic effect, whether it's a recovery tool, whether it's its comm matrix, whether you're using it as a tactical uh, ISR platform. Uh, there are so many different applications for it. Um, and also the manufacturing behind it. Like there's, there's a bunch of stuff that special tactics is involved in and that, that may not be, I'm going to deploy to Afghanistan for six months and go do missions. Yeah. All awesome things. You and I both experienced it. It was a lot of fun. You learned a lot, um, a lot of bad times as well. Um, but ultimately we got really good at hunting people and, and using air superiority to do those things. So now how can we bring air superiority to a fight where we aren't going to have you know, one random essay, whatever, seven out there, some man pad that we used to always say in our cast brief yeah. before that was like taboo. Uh, yeah, HMG, small arms, and a man pad, question mark, <laughs> on your update. Um, but there are actually strategic threats out there that are a uh, serious risk to our maritime focus, our space focus, our cyber stuff, uh, and also the Air Force, which you and I dearly care about mm-hmm. uh, since we're in the Air Force. And uh, special tactics is getting after how to uh, defeat those problem sets, build survivability, uh, and then get after uh, anti-axis area denial, uh, A2AD, which is a huge priority for the Geographic Combatant Command, multiple ones, I should say, indo yeah. and uh, General Kabuli at, uh, at UCOM, uh, led by 
The air component is led by General Hecker. Yusefi, we're working very closely uh, with him, which is why I'm here, out here at Nellis, uh, was part of this CAF web tech brief, to go over all the things that I'm talking about. And a lot of that, the stuff that you mentioned that we did, really kind of has shifted Yusefi's focus on how to uh, defeat systems that they thought were unbeatable. Uh, and it was, we figured it out from a soft lead component of, hey, we might want to relook at our calculus on how we do this. It is not some, you know, untenable position that we, we, we are not able to defend against. We, we have game against them. Here's some new tactics, but let's all join hands uh, and figure out how we can make it better, right? Yeah. Because we're just a small piece of it, and like, you safe. He's got a lot of lot of smart people. Right? Oh yeah, Air, Air Force in general, CAF too. Like weapons school, I'm, I'm very humbling every time I come here. And our piece of what we're doing at the the leading edge of this conflict is changing a lot of those tactics, getting after strategic stuff, which we haven't done before. Um, but you're also, I guess, you, sh you we're also at like the operational level, building partnerships and relationships. Like you still get to go out and work with. Besides, like all the operational, real mission stuff we're doing, the training piece of it, the relationships, you are still going out there and working with some of the, the very best that Europe has to, to offer. You're still getting to go work with UK soft, mm -hmm. uh, Polish soft, Norwegian, Finnish, um, Swedish, all the Scandinavian countries, and they are all very, very, very so good, good at what so they do. Good. <laughs> They're very good at what they do. And, um, and I think it's also paid off seeing the relationships we've both been there throughout their training pipeline yep. and watching those countries change, not, not necessarily to speak for like, say the Brits, like the, um, or the Poles, but everyone else like Sylvanian, Lithuanian, Latvians, Estonians, watching their, so their soft force. And you are a piece of that, building that and making them a competent operator. And there are some things that they are better at us than, mm -hmm. um, and seeing where they've, where, where they've been and where they're coming like that, that is a huge piece of it that you get to go and train, work your skills, be a combat controller, be a PJ, um, and then also learning from how can you survive in Arctic warfare, for example, in the Arctic Circle. And you get to learn a ton, tons of things that you're able to take as an operator and go from different theaters, and you're just collecting from the, some of the best the world has to offer in terms of the you know, special operations. Uh, in, in Army and Navy don't necessarily get to do that as much uh, as we do, since given what we are as a multi-role, multi-domain um, asset for, for the Department of Defense. And I think um, the 321st, the 320th Special Tactics Squadrons right now, um, they're so busy, in fact. The two-series squadrons, what I mean by two-series, is uh, the 2-1, the 2-2, the 2-3, the 2-6 STS. Um, they, they are now being uh, RFF'd. To, to come support us on a more uh, more regular basis, and, and they're going to be on a rotational basis because there is mission happening. If it wasn't happening, why are we requesting yeah. <laughs> three three teams from the stateside units to come? Well, supplement a lot us. of people don't understand that yeah. the the and, and why would they? Is that you know the Okinawa unit and right. the the Mildenhall unit? They are not as large as the stateside units, so right. we will supplement. <clears throat> the 320th and 321st with folks. So an RFF is a request for forces. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, no thanks. worries. I did it again. My bad. <laughs> um, so getting people out there to help support and help, you know, kind of bolster what you guys are providing, what you guys are doing. So it's it's good. Yeah, man. Um, I mean, I guess kind of like closing probably, the only thing I can think of uh, to say about like what we're doing as a special tactics um regardless of what everyone is saying out there uh like i'm sure we've seen all a bunch of funny instagram stuff uh there i don't think that this generation is gonna is gonna feel like they missed out uh cause that's some one thing i've heard uh from new guys coming to the team is like hey this is a common thing we we think we're you know we missed out in the war in afghanistan and then they're on team for for a year and sometimes yeah just like in any like Setting up a new strategic relationship, it takes time. Excuse me, but after a while, they come back and they, uh, you'll hear them say, man, I got to do stuff that the guys who were my instructors in the pipeline don't even know about or don't have yeah. anything. Uh, they, they didn't get the right clearance for it or because there was no need at the time. Um, so, yeah, we're moving into more sensitive things that we, we haven't done before, uh, which, which is really cool because you're, you're setting up, you know, the generation that's coming after you 
uh, same thing, you know, the guys who started nine 11 did for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it, it is really cool to watch that happen and build upon it. And yes, to be honest with you, it will have its frustrating moments, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not going to always be rainbows and butterflies, but getting back to like go getters who are trying to come in assessment selection, that's why we need the very best and brightest because they're going to be asked to do things that other normal airmen would never be asked to do. Yeah. Uh, ever. <laughs> right. Like the whole anytime, any place, anywhere, like being a soft operator and, and being able to lead as say an E4 and you're briefing O sixes about a mission that you're doing and getting authorities to do that mm -hmm. up to like my rank where you're brief, you know, briefing GOs on which we have no business sitting in the same room with them as <laughs> right. <laughs> like, uh, I think they would probably argue that. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. general officer would probably argue, yeah, of course I want an E89, E7 yeah, yeah. in there exactly. briefing me. But at the same time, like we feel, it's like, oh, like I was telling you with yeah. General Clark, the, yeah. the SOCOM commander, like I was at a table with him and I'm like, dude, I have no business exactly. being at this table. And then him calling on me numerous times, I'm like, God, I just hope I don't say anything stupid. Yeah, let me just uh, yeah. Yeah, think before I talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which I have no doubt that I did say some really stupid shit, <laughs> uh, but he never called me on it. So <laughs> uh, nice, man. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, dude, you already hit advice. So unless there's there's anything else, I think we'll just close it out here. No, uh, if if you guys do end up trying out, you will you will not regret it. Like I opened up the statement with, I think uh, aspect war has led to some of the most trying times uh, of my life, but also a process to get through them and some of the best times and I wouldn't be the the guy I am here um, now without without those experiences that Special Warfare provided me yeah. and all the friends that I've made across and enemies I should say <laughs> <laughs> friends across in my career um, it, it's been awesome man like there is not a better job uh, yeah. out there um, there are a couple ones that are close there's not quite like special tactics aspect war no you know, yep 100 percent so. agree so dude thanks for coming on yeah, really appreciate it it's good seeing you yeah, good you and we're out here everybody light up